Okay, good evening. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Urbana City Council for Monday, March 23rd, 2020. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown? Here. Colebrook? Here. Hersey? Here. Jacobson? Here. Miller? Here. Roberts? Here. Wu? Here. Mayor Marlin? Here. Charlie, we're not hearing anything in council chambers. Jason has control. Thank you. Uh, next item is approval of minutes from the previous meetings. This is a public hearing on March 9th, uh, the meeting on March 9th, and a special meeting on March 16th. I'll move approval of those minutes. A second. Can you identify yourself, please? Sharice. Hi, Sharice. Moved by Jared, <laughs> seconded by Sharice. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. And just for the record, um, because it wasn't projecting here in the council chambers, we have um, Bill Brown, Sharice Hersey, Eric Jacobson. Is Dennis here? Yes. Dennis yes, Roberts. Yes, he is. Mary Alice Wu. Yes. Okay, so we have five council members attending via Zoom and two are here in person. So because this is a new format for us, um, I wanted to describe the logistics for tonight's meeting. Per the provisions of the gubernatorial disaster proclamation and executive order number five, the provisions of the Open Meetings Act 5 AL ILCS 120, requiring in-person attendance by members of a public body are suspended. In addition, Section 4 of the City of Urbana Temporary Emergency Ordinance to address the COVID-19 pandemic provides for meetings of the Urbana City Council to be conducted electronically. So tonight we have a, we have a hybrid approach there. In addition to the City Council members attending, the City staff attending in person are City Administrator Carol Mitten and City Attorney Jim Simon, um, our Sustainability and Resilience Manager Scott Tess is zooming in, City Clerk Charlie Smythe is attending in person and he's sitting in a separate room, UPTV Manager Jason Liggett and Austin Pontius are at the controls and they're in a separate room as well. So this meeting is being streamed live as usual and it'll be recorded for later viewing on UPTV. The recording also will be posted to the city's website tomorrow. Due to technical difficulties and the fact that this is a uh, learning process for all of us, public input will be taken tonight via email. You can email it to cityclerk, C-I-T-Y-C-L-E-R-K, at urbanaillinois.us. Comments will be entered into the record. Per Section 10 of Urbana's Temporary Emergency Ordinance to address the COVID-19 pandemic and the Governor's Executive Order Number 8 to stay at home, the Urbana City Building is closed to the public tonight in order to protect the health and welfare of city employees and reduce spread of disease in the community. There are no members of the public in the audience. In order to facilitate a smooth interchange between virtual and in-person council members, I'm going to do the following for each agenda item that's reported out of the Committee of the Whole. And I'll actually I'll wait until we get to that point and I'll go over the procedure for that as well. So at this point, we um, ask for any additions to the agenda. There are none. Is there any public input that has come in via email? Uh, not at this point. Not at this point. Next up is reports of the standing committee, and that'll be reported out by uh, committee chair Jared Miller. So after Chair Miller moves the item out of the committee, I'm going to ask Bill Colbrick, since he's here in person, to second it. And then I'm going to call on each virtual attendee individually for questions. Um, followed by each of you who, who are here in person. And then following the questions, I'll go through and ask each virtual attendee individually for comments and discussion. And I'm again back to the uh, comments from each in-person attendee. 
And if you, if you think of something and your question arises, just take a note of it, and when I get to you, then, then we'll, you can ask that question. And that way, we can avoid kind of jumping in over each other. And I ask those who are attending to please, uh, especially those electronically, please speak clearly and slowly so um, the recording secretary can hear. So, Chair Miller, um, we have two ordinances to report out. All right, well, last week uh, the committee of the whole met and sent uh, two items forward to full council, both uh, that received recommendations for approval. The first of which is ordinance number 2020-03-009, an ordinance authorizing the purchase <coughs> of certain real estate, specifically 1107 North Gregory Street. On behalf of the committee, I move approval. And I second it. Moved by Jared, seconded by Bill. Are there any questions? I'll start with Mary Alice. No, not at this time. Eric? I have no questions. Sharice? No, I don't have any questions. Dennis? No, I think we covered it pretty well during our committee meeting. And Bill Brown? No questions. No questions, okay. Any questions from those in person? None from me. None from me. Okay. Um, any comments? We'll start again. Mary Alice, any comments? Nope. Eric? No. Sharice? No. Bill Brown? No comments. Dennis Roberts? I think it's positive because it's, uh, it satisfies some of the needs we have for community development and it supports the, uh, um, the continuation of the use of this building as a facility for uh, uh, affordable housing. Thank you. Jared, comments? I'm good. Bill no comments. Okay. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown? Yes. Colebrook? Yes. Hersey? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. Roberts? Yes. And Wu? Yes. That motion passes. Jared? All right, next up is uh, resolution number 2020-03-015R, a resolution adopting financial policies. On behalf of the committee, I move approval. And I second it. Moved by Jared, seconded by Bill. I'll go through um, virtual attendees. Any questions? Mary Alice? Nope. Eric? No. Sharice? No, I think we kind of covered that pretty good last week. Okay. Uh, Bill Brown? No questions. Dennis? No, I don't have any. Jared? No, none here. And Bill? No questions. Okay. Any comments or discussion? I'll start going back the other way. Uh, Jared? Um, nope. Uh, um, Dennis Roberts? No, I don't have any. Bill Brown? Nope. Sharice? No. Eric? <laughs> no. Mary Alice? No. Bill Colbrook? No. Okay, will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown? Yes. Colbrook? Yes. Hersey? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. Roberts? Yes. Wu? Yes. That motion passes. Reports of special committees. Reports of officers. Okay, we'll move on to new business. Is Scott Tess, uh, has he joined us? I thought so. We think so? Okay. I see him. He's here. He's here. Okay. Uh, first up is resolution number 2020-03-016R, which is a resolution approving a solar facility ground lease with Solar Star Urbana Landfill East, LLC. And then uh, another resolution, 2020-03-017R, resolution approving a solar facility ground lease with Solar Star Urbana Landfill West. Um, Scott, would you like to present this topic? We do have a backup plan for Scott to call in. 
about if Carol would you like to begin and then hopefully Scott will chime in on the phone. I will do my best and I'll, I'll try to summarize rather than read um, the memo. But um, you'll remember that at the end of um, 2017, um, we completed a qualifications based solicitation to try to find um, a, a, an entity that would um, that would uh, build a, a solar array on the city's closed landfill and we selected SunPower and we entered into a lease option with SunPower and that gave them uh, SunPower the exclusive right to develop the solar array for a period of um, two years. So in 2019, they were, uh, the City and Sun Power project was selected for two low-income community solar incentives for two separate solar developments on the landfill. Um, we had originally uh, been pursuing a different type of incentive program, and this has turned out to be, I think, a much, um, a much more advantageous fit all around given the nature of the program and so forth. So um, the, co the project companies allow SunPower to bring in an investor who optimally finance the projects, and SunPower has selected NextAmp, which is a firm with extensive experience investing in solar energy assets. So SunPower remains contractually involved in the project pr to provide post-contract services, and um, electricity purchasers who are subscribers can buy a sh or lease a share of, com of the community solar system. And it's, it's helpful to the city because we're going to be a, a large user and there's very competitively priced electricity that will come from this. So um, low income residents will be able to take advantage of this particular solar program. And that's the part that is really helpful in the community. So um, what you have in front of you um, are two resolutions because there's two separate um, ground leases because of the nature of the ownership of the landfill. So um, I, I guess, and I had, I had sent this to uh, the council um, to s a, a little ahead of, of a normal distribution of packets to see if people had any, any questions. The reason we're coming back to the council is we had originally, when we did the lease option, um, the council had approved language for the, the substantive terms of the lease. And even though um, there haven't been any substantive changes, the, the changes we have made were considered to be sufficiently, um, sufficiently different that we needed to come back to the council. So there's not, it, there's not really a whole lot of change, but um, we're doing this to make sure that we're legally um, Oh, we can hear Scott now? Great. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that introduction, and I understand we have Scott Tess on the phone. Thanks. That was a great summary. Sorry, I, I reconnected with uh, computer audio, and if you can hear me now, that seems to be working. It's, you're great. Um, we'll okay. go through and see if council members have any questions. We'll start with the virtual attendees. Um, Mary Alice, do you have any questions for Scott? Yes, I have two questions, um, and I'm sure they were covered when we looked at this previously. My first question is that $300,000 will be um, paid to the city, and it will be distributed uh, basically one-third, two-thirds. And am I correct in that assumption? So there are two separate leases for two separate solar arrays. Uh, one of those solar arrays sits entirely on land, a landfill parcel that the city owns. The other solar array sits on two different landfill parcels. One of those the city owns, the other the Champaign-Urbana Solid Waste Disposal System owns. So for the first solar array I described that's completely on city property, that will be a one-time upfront $300,000 check. For the other solar array, that's the one that will be prorated on the basis of how much of each entity's property the solar array occupies. And so my assumption is is that the funds for both of these leases, uh, the 300000 from one and then the basically 133000 from the other will go into the general funds, is that correct? Yes, I think that's where they will go. Uh, we've, we've talked about um, utilizing that money for some landfill maintenance and activities that um, we've been contemplating. Okay, and my second question has to do with, Carol had mentioned that this would be an opportunity 
for um, low-income residents to take advantage. I was wondering if you could expand upon that. Sure. So the incentive we uh, were successful in gaining is the uh, low-income community solar incentive. So that's an income-qualified program from Solar for All, um, which is a state of Illinois program with the Illinois Power Agency. The low-income community solar program um, allows income-qualified folks to take advantage of um, some really good pricing. The, the point of the incentive is to bring down the cost of solar and allows low-income households to you know, have access to solar, to renewable energy. And so um, there's going to be a – the developers will have um, – uh, an effort, a, a subscription effort, a marketing effort to um, recruit households who would be interested in this and they'll subscribe um, just like subscribing to any other retail electric supply offer. And then the city will be an anchor tenant, will we'll purchase a, a, a portion of the supply from the solar array as well. So does that mean when you say they're going to solicit um from people, does that mean that they're going to be sending out mailers? They're going to be going door to door. Um, is it a combination of those? It's going to be a combination of strategies, uh, but I think it's going to center around some public meetings and other media communications. I don't anticipate them going door to door, but there may be some some direct mail. Okay, thank you, mm -hmm. Eric. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I'd like to pursue a little bit farther the line of uh, query that Mary Alice began, how, how do low-income households actually qualify you, uh, qualify uh, a household? Do they, they submit information about their income or how does it work? There are a couple of different pathways to, to get income qualified. Um, folks that are interested should um, first go to the link that we have in the in the memo, and they can determine themselves um, if they if they think they're going to qualify. Um, but in terms of the program having the the um, you know verifying, there um, there there is the potential for um, submitting income records. There's also a pathway whereby, if I remember the details correctly, they can. Um, if they're in a, uh, a particular low-income census block and they sign an affidavit or some such document um, uh, stating that they qualify or what their income is, that will get a household qualified as well. But that process will also be, you know, folks will be um, ushered through that process by the subscription manager when they start their work. Any any further questions, Eric? No, no, that sounds that sounds fine. I'll just state for the record that I assume that that process does not use up much of the savings. That the cost of doing going through all that will be almost negligible. But just I'll put a question mark on that. Will be almost negligible. Uh, the cost, which cost and accruing to who are you thinking of? The, the costs of verifying income eligibility. That cost will be borne by the developer. Okay. Okay. Sharice, do you have any questions? No, I don't have any questions at this time. I assumed, I remember we voted on this a while back, didn't we? Correct. Yeah, Correct. we've, we, yes. we had a, a uh, qualifications-based selection, then a lease option, and then we won the incentives from the state, and now we're converting all of that into the 15-year lease. Okay. No, I, I don't have any real questions right now. Uh, actually, Eric answered, asked, and, and, and Mary Alice asked the questions I would have asked. Thank you. Bill Brown, questions? Um, yeah. I think the last time we discussed this, there might have been something going through the zoning um, process to add solar use or photovoltaic, photovoltaics to um, the zoning ordinance as a use under some categories. I don't ever remember that coming to council. Where, where are we with that process? 
I, that did happen, but I, I can't remember the, the specific type of approval. Um, but we did, we did, the, the project did get the zoning approval that was necessary. Um, I can try and look it up real quick, but I don't remember off the top of my head what the specific approval type was. So is that currently uh, light industrial? Um, I think it's conservation. Conservation, okay. I think. Um, and then in the, in the contract, it said they could use it for any type of solar generation. Um, I think we're assuming it's going to be photovoltaic, but I know there's also that type with the mirrors that has a boiler in the middle, and I don't know if that would be appropriate for that area. Um, no, no, it it'll like be. That's, yeah. It'll be solar photovoltaic, and there's a, a at the end of the um, attachment in your packet. There's a, a site plan, a draft site plan, anyway, what they're planning at this point. Yeah, I wonder why it's any type in the contract. I, I really appreciate all the work you guys have put into on this. It looks like it was a lot of work. <laughs> it's been a couple of years. <laughs> um, so just to clarify, it's. A 15-year initial period and then two potential five-year renewals, basically, so it's right. 25 years. Correct. Okay. Um, yeah, if, if, if uh, Lori is listening in, maybe she could clarify what the zoning, uh, how, how it, would the zoning was approved. I'm not sure. I don't think Lori's on tonight. But we could find out for you. I'd be happy to follow up on that, and, and if it's and if it's important before the vote, I, I'll run upstairs. Um, no, I don't think it's I don't think it's that important. Um, I just I couldn't remember if we I didn't I didn't I took a look at our zoning ordinance. I didn't see it mentioned um, as a, it's, but maybe it was. Um, you know, interpreted to be allowable in some area or something. I, th I think I might have just found it. Let me take a look here. An ordinance approving a special use permit, 901 North Smith Road, January 17th. Okay. There's a memo. So uh, special use, and was it for photo photovoltaic? It probably didn't say, it probably just said solar. <laughs> okay. Let me see. Looks like it's scanned in, so I can't keyword search it, maybe. Oh, no, there it is. Solar energy system is what it's, is what the, is what the memo says. And so I'm guessing, just going through it. Yeah, it looks like everything is solar Okay, well, I guess if they, if they propose system. something other than that, then we could uh, potentially launch a plan case. <laughs> if, it was, if it was something very different than photovoltaic, we could probably launch a plan case to consider the impact. Yeah, I'm looking through it, and it, it says solar energy system some places and solar photovoltaic at other places. Um, but I, I, I don't anticipate anything other than solar panels going in there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Bill? Uh, nope, that's it, okay. thanks. Dennis, questions? I guess I had one, um, just briefly, Scott, uh, in that the display will be erected and it'll be there for five years and probably you know, 10, 15 years, 20 years. Um, can you kind of briefly uh, outline uh, any kind of maintenance issues, which um, and who will be maintaining the array? Mm -hmm. I assume probably the installer. Yeah, there's very little maintenance, but there is some. So there will occasionally be some electrical work. There will be um, seasonal vegetation maintenance. So, for instance, the uh, the proper you know the developer, the operator of the solar array is not going to want grass and trees growing up in front of the panels and shading them. So that'll, there'll be some seasonal landscape maintenance. Everything within the footprint of the lease, and, and there will be a fence around it, 
everything within that footprint will be the maintenance responsibility of the developer and, and their operators. So the city, uh, this actually takes these, the, these portions of the landfill off of the city books in terms of maintenance costs. All that will be borne by the developer. Well, it's a rather amazing thing to uh, turn what is uh, basically a, a city's uh, land that uh, is not in generating very much revenue into something that potentially has a little bit of income for the city. Yeah. And benefit for the people. So that's very good. Thank you. Okay. Jared, any questions? Uh, just two quick ones, Scott. Uh, we don't get to take credit for the 15 year lease, correct? The city can't apply that towards our goal of uh, green energy. So because we can't claim those credits. The way that the state is incentivizing these projects, they're not, they are providing cash, of course, but they are in exchange taking the renewable energy credits or certificates generated by the renewable energy asset, the solar arrays. And so whoever owns the renewable energy credits gets to make an environmental claim. So no, we shouldn't be counting that up towards anything, but um, certainly, you know, facilitating a renewable energy development is good for, you know, the climate. Of course. Uh, second quick question, uh, what's our, what's the build time f or from uh, the end of this agreement when we approve it to uh, implementation? I don't have uh, I don't have a, a construction schedule from the developer, um, so I, I can't answer that. And I don't have a start date either. They do have um, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's in the records. Um, they they had 18 months to uh, you know start delivering electricity from the day that they were awarded the first of the two incentives, and I think that. Uh, that might be in my memo when that date, when that award was, um, but it was late last year. Um, so there is a ticking clock on the, on this project. Um, it, it's not going to linger. Okay. Um, well, if you uh, if you get any news on that, just uh, fill us in. It's not going to affect my vote. I was just curious. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Bill Colbrook, any questions? Uh, yeah, I've just got one. Um, it looks like um, you know this work in this debate you know started like you know back in 2017 so it's been several years and of course I wasn't on the City Council then so I apologize I'm just trying to get up to speed on some of the history uh, just looking at the map it, it looks like these two fields are somewhat boundary locked uh, you know by some natural uh, areas and in, in the interstate I'm just curious is this at all expandable I know the city owns land to the north of this field and I'm just curious if a project like this is expandable in the future? There's not a lot of developable space left um, on our landfill parcels. There's a little bit of balance of land, um, but it starts getting less flat um, in some places significantly so. Um, these arrays are also located in portions of the property that have the least amount of trees to remove. Um, so this is probably going to be it, um, although we can always, uh, you know, draw a polygon around other surplus vacant land out there and, and do a, a, another procurement and see if uh, someone out there thinks that they can make a commercially viable project. Um, but this is this is probably going to be it. There's just not a lot of balance of, of good developable, developable land there. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to council comments and discussion. Uh, we'll start with Mary Alice. Any comments or discussion? No, not at this time. Thank you. Eric? Uh, just sort of an anecdote. If you want to laugh, the early history of getting solar power from reflecting mirrors is very amusing and it's full of things catching fire and melting and stuff like that so photovoltaic is much more prosaic Cherise? no no comment <laughs> bill brown no nope. dennis roberts no nothing 
Jared? No comment, thank you. Bill Colbrick? I can't follow that, so no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will call for a motion. I move uh, that we approve or resolution number 2020-03-016R, a resolution approving a solar facility ground lease with Solar Star Urbana Landfill East, LLC. And I second it. Moved by Jared, seconded by Bill Colbrick. Will the clerk please call the roll? I guess I should have asked for discussion after the motion, but I think we're good. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown? Yes. Colbrook? Yes. Percy? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. Roberts? Yes. And Wu? Yes. That motion passes. I'd like to make a motion that we approve resolution number 2020-03-017R, resolution approving a solar facility ground lease with Solar Star Urbana Landfill West, LLC. And I second it. Moved by Jared, seconded by Bill Colbrook. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown? Um, actually, I had discussion on this one. Okay, We're, we can do discussion. <laughs> Just to come back at Eric, I'm not sure if that was supposed to be a jab at me for, for bringing up the mirror thing, <laughs> but there are uh, three huge, huge solar installations in the Mojave Desert. If you fly between here and Los Angeles, you can see them, and they use mirrors and boilers. Um, so if they're big enough, they can be very efficient in the modern world. But that's the only discussion I had. <laughs> Thank you. Any other discussion? Yeah, I'll, I believe. Oh, oh go ahead. No, uh, this is Dennis, and I also believe that there was uh, such an array at Sandia Laboratories um, at in Albuquerque, South Albuquerque. Okay, Eric, you had a comment. Yeah, just it wasn't a jab at anybody. The early days of any technology are often amusing, and this one was amusing in spectacular ways. <laughs> as is the early days of using Zoom for meetings. So yes, right. <laughs> one day we'll look back on this as well. Are we ready for uh, the vote? Any other comments? Okay, will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown? Yes. Colbrook? Yes. Percy? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. Roberts? Yes. Wu? Yes. That motion passes. And last item under new bids business is ordinance number 2020-03-016, which is ratification of emergency order 20-01 relating to the delivery of package liquor, and that was issued on March 18, 2020. This was an emergency order that authorizes certain liquor license holders in the city of Urbana to provide for off-premises delivery of um, alcoholic liquor in the sealed original package for off-premises consumption. This emergency order followed the executive order issued by the governor where, that closed all um, bars and restaurants in the state of Illinois. And in an effort to um, assist local businesses to continue their business and to continue to um, this would be liquor license holders to continue their business, continue to sell alcohol, and in, in some cases in, in uh, conjunction with food. Um, I issued this emergency order. So this provides for the sale and delivery of the package, um, let's see, sale and delivery of packaged alcoholic liquor for off-premises consumption by Class A, those are the bars, Class R1 and R2, those are restaurants, Class MB2 liquor licensees, that's the microbreweries, and sale and delivery of alcoholic liquor for off-premises consumption by Class BB liquor licensees. I've had a question about um, what about the other local um, aspects of the code, does that apply to these sales? And yes, the only thing that's different is is the ability to, sale, to sell um, and deliver packaged liquor for off-premises consumption. So they're still required, everything else in our liquor code still applies, the dram shop insurance, the verification of age, of the server, the age of the um, purchaser, the hours of operation, et cetera. So nothing um, else was changed other than extending this to the liquor licensees to have the ability to sell um, uh, 
for off-premises consumption. And I have to say people have been very creative and innovative in how they've adapted over the past week to doing this, and I appreciate the, the um, patience of the license holders as we worked our way through this, and um, I very much appreciate the way the public has been supporting our local businesses. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. We'll start down the line again uh, with Jared this time. No questions. Um, who's sitting there? That would be Dennis. <laughs> no, I don't have questions. Bill Brown? No questions. Sharice? None at all. <laughs> Was that a no? No, oh, yeah, that's a no. <laughs> okay. Um, Eric? Sorry. Yeah, I'm good with this. Okay. Mary Alice? Um, I have two comments, but I don't know if this is the time to make them, so. I don't have any questions. Okay. Well, let's. I'll get right back to you, Bill Colbrook. Any questions? One question: uh, mm -hmm. Is this is the intent of this to uh, support local business uh, to to keep commerce thriving and keep revenues flowing for local businesses and restaurants? Yes. Mary Alice, comments. Um, I just have two comments. The first one is, A, I'm really impressed by how hard the city has been working to raise awareness of all the different changes that have been going on. Um, it seems like things change every day. I've noticed that the city has tried to ensure that the public was very aware of the changes and would be able to visit the businesses. Um, so thank you for that. My second comment uh, has to do with, oh, I just forgot my second comment. Ah, my second comment has to do with um, our discussion the last time in terms of how to handle these emergency orders. I think this is a perfect example of bringing something so that we can have a conversation. So I also think that what we talked about last time is, is working well in this case. So those are my two comments. Thank you. Eric, any comments? Um, no, this is just the right thing to do at this time. Cherise? I'm going to take that as a no comment. Um, Bill Brown. No, I don't have any comment. Okay. <laughs> Bill Brown? Um, no, just to uh, say thanks for uh, doing it. I think we have to maintain a lot of flexibility and let people uh, be creative and find new ways to deliver services for a while. Mm -hmm. um, Dennis? Well, I think it's um, a useful tool for small businesses to retain customers, and I think it's a, a provable thing. Thank you. Jared? No comment, but I do have a motion. Great. Uh, I'm going to move ordinance number 2020-03-016, ratification of emergency order 20-01, delivery of packaged liquor that was issued on March 18, 2020, be approved. And I second it. All right, will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown? Yes. Colebrook? Yes. Percy? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. Roberts? Yes. And Wu? Yes. That motion passes. Um, before we adjourn, I just have a few announcements. There's no meeting next week, virtual or in person. It's the fifth Monday. Um, I want to again thank everyone for complying with the governor's executive order to stay at home, shelter in place. I, I cannot tell you how proud we all are of our community for the response to, to these um, actions. And I am grateful to the state of Illinois, the governor for his leadership here. He's taken a lot of the actions that, that we would have had we would have taken at the local level, but the fact that they're statewide is saving lives. So uh, we are very, very um, thankful for that. Um, the Landscape Recycling Center is closed um, until further notice. If you had a delivery that was scheduled for this week, those deliveries will be completed, but no new sales or orders will be taken. The city building um, under the uh, emergency declaration that you passed last week. Um, we have closed the city building to the public. Um, people needing to um, visit, for example, the police service desk or 
have an appoint can do so by appointment and as well as other offices here. But the doors to the um, exterior are are locked, and this is for the safety of the employees who are still working in the building as well as for the public. We have transitioned a number of employees to working remotely from home. I'm one of them, so I'm figuring out my new reality and um, we do have some staff in the building as well and that's one of the reasons that uh, we are closed to the public. All city functions are continuing and we expect that to be the case um, through the course of this um, of this pandemic as it moves through our country. So again, I want to thank everyone for their cooperation. I want to thank UPTV, um, people behind the scenes, Jason Liggett and Austin Pontius for making this meeting go very, very smoothly, as well as the city clerk and his staff. So um, we miss you, but we're glad you're staying physically apart and um, we'll stay in touch. Could, I, could I ask if the clerk received any other public input during the meeting? Oh, thank you for reminding us. Any other public input? No, nothing's come in. Okay. Thank you very much. And with no further business before this virtual and in-person um, meeting, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>